Dear Heavenly Father, as we open your word today, I ask for your Holy Spirit's guidance and direction in everything that I do and say. And Father, I ask that the Holy Spirit will also be active in each person here so that they will understand what Paul is trying to get across to us. And we thank you for the messages that he gives us. And Father, we just ask for understanding, for discernment. And I just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to talk about two covenants. Now we can spend a lot of time on covenants and old covenant and new covenant and examine it from this direction and this direction, but Paul has a very special thing that he's using these two covenants as an example for us today. Our text today is considered by many to be probably the most difficult passage in the book of Galatians, and I believe there's three specific reasons for that conclusion. It presupposes a knowledge of the Old Testament which most Christians sadly do not have, especially non-SDA Christians. Very few Christians are familiar with the details of many of the Old Testament stories and writings. You've heard it a thousand times, well, I'm a New Testament Christian. Well, guess what? You miss out on so much of the New Testament because you don't understand the background story that came from the Old Testament. And so it's about the whole thing, folks, not just about half of it. And Paul's writing in this passage is somewhat technical, which, is, which was very familiar to Paul, who was highly educated in the scriptures, being a Pharisee, and it was also familiar to those in which he was writing to. The people that Paul was writing to were somewhat more or less familiar with what he was saying because some are Jews, some are Gentiles. Some had a lifelong background in the scriptures and some did not. The people that, were all, that Paul were, were writing to needed what he was giving. But Paul went to great lengths to help his reader follow his train of thought, but without a background in the Old Testament teaching, a 21st century Christian is going to struggle to follow. This passage is difficult for most of Christianity today because it goes against the teaching of dispensationalism, which most of Christianity believes. Dispensationalists believe that the Old Covenant and New Covenant have absolutely everything to do with time. In other words, the Old Covenant is that period of time between Moses and Christ. The New Covenant is that period of time between Christ and the end of the world. The, this teaching suggests that mankind was saved from Moses to Christ by their law keeping in which they had to keep perfectly in thought, word, and deed. And that mankind is saved from Christ to the end of time through, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. But if you read the New Testament carefully, especially in the writings of Paul, you will discover that the term Old Covenant is, supply, is, is given in two, in two tenses, in two senses, sorry, or methods. And we need, we need to understand what he's talking about very clearly. First, it is supplied historically. And when it is applied historically, it does refer to time. And we covered this when we studied Galatians 3, 23 through 25. And you can follow along in your study guide that was given to you. And if you don't have one, who needs a study guide? Or a sermon handout. You got it. Okay, nobody needs... Oh, he needs one up here. <clears throat> Don is on his way. 
Galatians 3, 23 through 25, before the coming of this faith, now what is this faith? Faith in Jesus. That's absolutely right. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up into the faith that was to come so that uh, I better I better hit that again locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed so the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith now that this faith has come we are no longer under a guardian and we see in that verse that it is about period of time before Christ and after Christ it is true that the entire human race came under condemnation when Adam sinned. But Paul tells us that when God gave the law at Mount Sinai through Moses, sin became transgression. In other words, sin became a legal offense because God is just and could not hold you accountable for your sins in the same way until he had given that law in written form so from the time of Moses to the time of Christ well let me back up again okay so from the time of Moses and the time of Christ humanity legally historically was under the curse of the law because sin was no longer just missing the mark sin was now transgression because mankind had that law in written form. <clears throat> and the law says, the soul that sins, it must what? Die. Galatians 3.10. And you, and you can just follow right along to the verses in your, in your study guide. Or sermon notes. Sorry about that. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. How are you doing? Are you keeping the law perfectly in thought, word, and deed? Well, we'll find out why God made it that way. Then Christ came along and on the cross he redeemed humanity from the curse of the law and you'll find this in Galatians 3.13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So that time period from Moses to Christ is referred to as the uh, the New Testament is referred to as the Old Covenant but there is a second meaning that the New Testament gives to the term Old Covenant and it is a theological meaning and this second meaning refers to those who are trying to save themselves by their law keeping in contrast to salvation by grace which is of course the new covenant it is in this second sense that Paul is using or implying the old covenant in our text for today in Galatians 4 21 through 31 so the passage that we're covering this morning is extremely important for two reasons first to counteract the incomplete definition of the Old Covenant made by the belief in dispensationalism. And it is true that we're not living in that period from Moses to Christ. We're living after Christ. But theologically, it is possible for you and me to belong to the Old Covenant. Anyone who is depending on his performance either for salvation or for maintaining salvation or even contributing a little bit to your salvation still belongs very much so to the old covenant 
And it is in this sense Paul is discussing the two covenants in this passage. The second reason why this passage is important is because there is still today, because of our emphasis on the law as a people, there are still today many Adventists who, like the Galatian Christians, are trapped in a subtle form of legalism, which is indeed the Old Covenant. And that is why we are covering this very important subject today. You know, and I pray as, as we finish today that we will have a more clear understanding of what Paul is trying to get across to us about the difference between even today struggling under the old covenant or enjoying the freedom in Christ under the new covenant. And folks, those two cannot be mixed. They are absolutely mutually exclusive. It is either one or the other. You can't mix them. It just doesn't work that way. Now Paul's argument in this passage follows three steps. And you'll, you'll notice as you read through it. The first step is found in verses 22 to 23. <clears throat> and this will be back on the first page. Where Paul gives us the historical background. And basically the historical background is that Abraham had two sons. One from a slave woman called Hagar and her son was Ishmael. The other from from his <clears throat> wife Sarah, whose name was Isaac. The second step is from verses 24 to 27, where Paul takes these two sons and their mothers and uses them as types or symbols of the two methods of salvation. Salvation by the works of the law, which is the old covenant, which he defines as, re as a religion of bondage, the other is salvation by grace through faith or the new covenant which he defines as religion of freedom. Then the third step found in verses 28 through 31, Paul makes a personal application to his readers where he clearly states that Judaism is a religion of bondage because it is depending on the law for salvation and therefore is still in slavery even though it is in the time period after Christ. While true Christianity is the religion of freedom and brings peace, joy, and hope because in this system salvation is not based on how good you are but it's because of grace. Christ has already redeemed us from the curse of the law. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, those who are under grace, those who are under the new covenant. With this foundation, let's look at the passage so you'll see where, where Paul is coming from. We'll look at Galatians 4.21. And he starts with a question. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? You know, it's very important that we understand the question because the rest of his argument is based on a clear understanding of that one question. Tell me, you who want to be under the law. Because there are many Christians, including Adventists, who limit the phrase under law or who define the term under law to mean under condemnation. And that is not the meaning of the term under law. Now it is true that you are a sinner under the law. If you're a sinner under the law, you do, not, you do stand condemned. That is the logical conclusion. Why is that? Because the law condemns the sinner who is under its jurisdiction. But the term itself does not mean under condemnation. Tell me, 
how many people do you know who say, I want to be under condemnation? Do you get up in the morning and say, yes, I'm under condemnation again today? No? Well, Paul is talking to people. He says, you who want to be under the law. So it can't mean under condemnation because nobody, well, in their right mind, wants to be under condemnation. So what in the world is Paul trying to talk about then when, the term, when he uses the term under law? Well, the word under is a term that was used in Paul's day because he lived in a slave society and the Roman society was very much a slave society. And, and did you know that it said that nearly half of Roman society was slaves? Can you imagine? Half of the people in that society was a slave. So your chances of being a slave in that society were pretty good at 50 percent. Well, but the word under is the same term and used in the same way as being under the slave, being under the master. Which simply means that a slave was ruled by the master. He had no freedom. He was forced to do the will of the master, like it or not. He was not a civil servant. He was a slave. He had no choice. In fact, he owned nothing. Even the clothes on his back and the sandals on his feet belonged to the master. So the term under law simply means to be ruled by the law. What does it mean to be ruled by the law? Well, the law has distinct instructions. There are rules when you live under the law. What are the rules? Well, there's basically two. Obey and live and disobey and what? And die. That's the two basic rules. That, my friends, is what it, that's what it means by living under the law. You either do it and live, don't do it and die. Therefore, when you live under the law, you must justify yourself before God based totally on your performance. There is, one th there is one thing else that you need to know about under law. The law will not allow the transference of guilt and righteousness. No law will do that. No law, any law, God's or man's, you cannot condemn an innocent person in place of a guilty person. For example, if Ted Bundy's mother went to the judge and said, Dear Judge, I know my son is a multi-murderer, and I know that he stands guilty under the law and deserves death, but I love him, and I want to give myself in his place, I want to die so that my son can go free. What would the judge say? I don't think so, lady. It doesn't work that way around here. Right? You, you, you just can't do that. Therefore, if you live under law, you must save yourself based on your performance. And if you fail on one point, the law condemns you. James makes it very clear, and you follow along in your, in your sermon note, you'll see in James 2, verse 10, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles on just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. How can that be true? Well, it's true because the law is a unit. If you break a piece of it, the whole thing's broke. It's kind of like the mirror in your bathroom. If you break the corner off of it, it's broke, right? So when you break one piece of the law, you have broken the whole law. Now, Paul is telling the Galatian Christians 
who had given up on the gospel. He had gone to them, preached the gospel. They, they believed it and they were rejoicing in their newfound freedom in Christ and then later gave it all up and went back to trying to earn their salvation through their law keeping. They had given up on the gospel. They had given up grace. They were now attempting to go to heaven based on their performance. And Paul brought this out in Galatians 3.3 3, and he said, Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? He's telling them, you who desire to be saved by the obedience of regulations and requirements of the law. Now, but what does he mean by the law? Does he mean the Ten Commandments? Yes or no? We have some no's. Do we have any yeses? We have a yes. Okay. He is in a way referring to the Ten Commandments because they are in the first five books of Moses. What did the Jews call the first five books of Moses? They called them the books of Moses, but they also called them the books of the law. So when Paul's talking to these people about the law, he's not talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about all the ceremonies and all the washings and the ceremonial washings, the feast days, the special Sabbaths, all the stuff that was required of a good Jew. That's what he's saying. That whole system pointed to a coming Savior and the plan of salvation. It had its, it had its place, but after Christ, it no longer had a place in religion. You know, Paul reminds his readers in verse 22 that in the books of Moses, the books of the law, you will find a sto story of two sons. Do you know that in the books of the law, the gospel was being preached? We see these two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. To appreciate Paul's argument, you need to be familiar with how those two sons came into existence. And if you know the Old Testament story, you know how these two boys came into existence. One of them, because they didn't think God could fulfill his promise, so they had to help God. Did God need their help? No. And he showed them, but he waited till it was physically impossible for those two people to have a child. Did, did, there's no way. I mean, the doctors would tell them, uh, I don't think so, you need to go home. <laughs> but did, did they have a son of promise or not? Absolutely they did. God knows what he's doing, and when he promises, he fulfills it every single time. But, you know, we have to understand or be familiar with how these two sons came to existence, and it's, be, and it's important, otherwise you miss the whole point of what Paul's trying to show us here in this um, in this uh, text. But that is why so many find this passage difficult because they're not familiar with the Old Testament background story, which the people in Paul's day were very much familiar. Let me give you the background. God comes to Abraham and tells him in Genesis 12 2, I will make you into a great nation. Then in verse 4, he says, or, or it tells us that Abraham at that time was 75 years old when he set out from his people, from his, the land of his fathers in Haran. In Abraham's day, 75 was not quite the same as it is today. They lived longer. 
In those days, they lived much longer than we do today. He and Sarah did not have any children, and if God was to make him a great nation, he had to have at least one son, right? And God promised him a son. You can find the long story of how Abraham came to be called, or Abram came to be called Abraham, and how he came to have two sons, and one son was of a slave woman, and the other, the son of promise, who was born to a free woman. No, that whole thing is in Genesis chapter 15 through chapter 18. And it gives the full account, and we, but we certainly do not have time to cover that entire thing today. But I do recommend that you read that account when you go home, maybe this afternoon or tomorrow or sometime, Genesis 15 through Genesis 18, and get the background story in its completion and then come back to your sermon handout and go through that text again. And I think you'll find that there's an additional understanding. Now, many of you know the story by heart, and so you, you probably don't require it. But we can't cover three chapters in one sermon, otherwise we'd be here for a little while. So I, I just want to suggest and recommend that you read those those chapters in Genesis so you get a, a update on the story and then you'll get a little better understanding of what Paul's trying to get across to us here today. Once again, Paul is trying his best to help his readers in Galatia to understand the error of their ways in trying to find favor with God through their law keeping. We know that it cannot be done, but the devil seems to be real good at talking us into trying. But I would like to make the two covenants as simple as I can. And we're talking about the two covenants of Old Covenant, New Covenant as it comes to uh, law keeping and gospel or grace. It is God's plan of salvation to save as many people as he can. Amen? He must allow them, though, to make the decision to love him, their creator, or love themselves supremely. He has to allow that. God knows that these people have no idea of their condition, their hopeless condition after the fall of Adam that cast mankind into sin. To help mankind realize their lost hopeless condition, God made a covenant with them. To help mankind realize their lost, hopeless condition, God made a covenant with them. Now what, what are we talking about here? We're talking about uh, like a, a contract. I'll do this, and this person says I'll do that, and they agree to it, they sign it, and it's law, right? So that's what we got going on here. <clears throat> the covenant was a list of rules for them to follow, and the people said that they would obey these rules completely. This happened at Mount Sinai when God gave the children of Israel the Ten Commandments, and we, when he gave it, what did they say? All that you have said we will do. Is that what happened? Yeah, but very, and you're right, that, that is what happened. But they didn't follow through with it very well because it wasn't very long. They're dancing around a golden calf. So God said, this is what I want you to do. And they said, we promise. And that is the old covenant. It was broken, was it not? There's a need of a new covenant. Okay? Now follow along because as many of you know, 
there, there's more to the old covenant, new covenant story than, we're, than Paul's trying to get across to us today. He has something very specific that he's teaching. And so I, I, I don't want you to, to muddy the waters with other directions that we can go with the old and new covenant. We're, we're focusing pretty narrow here because Paul is focusing narrow. So here's, what, here's where we're going. And this is back to my attempt to make it as simple as I can. God realizes that these people don't have any idea of their lost condition. To help mankind to realize their lost hopeless condition, God made a covenant with them. But the covenant was broken. The Ten Commandments are perfect. They are just. They are the image of God's character. Yes or no? There's not anything wrong with the covenant. Or, or there isn't anything wrong with the famines. But the people broke their promise, their covenant, with God by worshiping another god, an idol, a golden calf. And you can call that first covenant the old covenant. What in the world was God supposed to do now? Do you think that the breaking of the old covenant was somehow a surprise to God? Oh man, I thought they'd do it. Is that what he said? No. I do not believe that for a second. God gave the old covenant knowing that it would be broken so that the people would understand that keeping the Ten Commandments perfectly in thought, word, and deed was not going to be within their reach. It simply isn't. Their self-centered minds were incapable of perfect actions, perfect thoughts and perfect motives and that's the kicker even if you come to church every sabbath and happy sabbath to everybody and uh, well often our motives aren't perfect god understood but he had to allow mankind to fail miserably to see their impossible condition Mankind had to see their lost condition or they would never see their need of who? Of a Savior, exactly. If you don't, if you're not thirsty, you don't know your body needs water. You know, a Savior would come to this world be born as a human, live the perfect life that we as humans cannot live. He died the death that we deserve to give us the eternal life that he deserves. But when does the new covenant come on the scene and with whom does God make this new covenant? Did he make it with me? You? Who did he make it for? The Bible tells us a story as an illustration of when that covenant happened. Not with mankind again. That did not work out so well, did it? So God the Father made a covenant with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The new covenant was God the Father and Jesus coming together, promising to redeem mankind back to his unfallen state of perfection that God created in Eden. Jesus fulfilled the new covenant with God the Father by coming down and giving his life a ransom for many. But how do we know that this covenant really happened? How do we know? Well, 
It's illustrated, believe it or not, in an Old Testament story found in Genesis chapter 15. And this is Abram speaking. Genesis 15, 8 through 10. You'll find it in your sermon handout. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him, cut them in two down the middle, and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. How many of you remember this story? See, you've read it. I will almost bet that you missed something that we're not going to miss today. This seems to be a custom that was a way of signing a covenant between two parties. They would pass but split carcasses, basically saying that if we do not faithfully fulfill the terms of this covenant, then we will be split in two. So this promise is going between these split carcasses, and if you break that, so you, you want to keep it, right? Genesis 15, 17. Follow along with me. And it came to pass. And I want you to picture this in your mind. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark. Do you have that picture in your mind? You have these carcasses lay there on the ground split. And the sun went down. There appeared two things. What was the first one? A smoking oven. What was the second one? A burning torch. And what did they do? They passed between those pieces. Did Abram pass between those pieces? Did any human pass between those pieces? No. But what passed between those pieces? The smoking oven represents God the Father. What was it on top of Mount Sinai that let people know he was up there? Smoke covered that mountain. The, the burning torch represents Jesus Christ, the light of the world. He was the one that lit up the, the children of Israel by night, and, you know, and all, all that stuff, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of smoke. Folks, it was God the Father and Jesus that passed through that making a covenant between themselves that they were going to take care of what they had promised. Speaking of Jesus and the Father, Zechariah wrote these prophetic words, and you'll find them in Zechariah 6.13. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory. He shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace shall be between who? Them both. Who's it talking about? Them both. Me and you? I don't think so. The council of peace shall be between them both. Paul wrote these words to the Romans and we'll find it in Romans 8, 3, and 4. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Then the righteous require, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us 
who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 1 Peter 1.20 He indeed was, what's the word? Foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. And I believe that walking between those carcasses wasn't at that moment the new covenant, but was God's promise to Abram that that promise had already been made before this earth began. That, that had already happened. The old covenant, new covenant, it's all the same covenant. But it, we call it the old covenant, new covenant, so that we can differentiate between the one that failed and, and, you know, the part that failed and part that succeeded. But it's all the same promise. God didn't change anything. He was just trying to get something across to us weak humans. And so we just need to understand that there is just one covenant and that happened and was foreordained before the foundation of the world. But is manifest in these last times to you. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God came not, sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved. There, are in, there were indeed and are indeed two covenants. One leads to slavery and death. One leads to Jesus and brings us salvation by, by redeeming us once again to our Heavenly Father. The more I investigate the Word of God, the more I feel His love. He knows my condition. I cannot hide who I am or the things that I do, but my friends, He loves me anyway. And you are loved just as much no matter how good you are or are not. God loves you with an everlasting love that you can't get rid of no matter how hard you try. Believe me, I tried for 35 years. Didn't work. He loves me anyway. Before we have our close or before we have our prayer, I would like for us to open our hymnals to 154, 155. They're they're the same song, but I want you to follow along the words and we'll just listen to the song and I think you'll receive a blessing. The song's titled, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. I survey the wondrous cross.
That's probably the greatest gospel song ever written. If you would like to give Jesus your life and your all, I would like for you to stand where you are and signify that desire. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for Paul's desperate plea to the Galatians to help them to understand the wiles of the devil that were happening in that day. But Father, help us to understand that it's very much alive today. And help us to be able to see truth. To be able to discern the difference between error and truth. But today, Father, we want to thank you for Jesus, for his precious gift. Offering his blood as a sacrifice for my sins. And Father, I want to give myself to you again today. I want to give you my life, my all. And those who are standing are signifying the same thing. And Father, we, we know that we need the Holy Spirit living in us to help change our wants and desires to every single day to be more like Jesus. Not so that we can go to heaven and get our earned reward, but because Jesus gave us that reward and we want to return that precious gift with obedience to you and love for each other. And Father, I thank you for the privilege, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen.